Please open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's start today's service, if we may, in verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? During the first century, it was the custom to refer somebody from a church to another church, to recommend someone from one church to another, and I remember over a decade ago, going to a particular church, speaking to somebody who was a part of such a church. And he said to me, well, what I'll do is I'll drop a line to the elders to let them know that this coming Sunday you will be joining them to break bread. That, of course, was found in the Brethren Assembly. But during the first century, like I say, it was the custom to commend person A to person B. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, Paul speaking to the Corinthians, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? The problem that Paul was up against, and there were many problems that he was up against, but the main problem that he was up against was the problem of false teachers and carnal Christians constantly questioning and attacking and trying to undermine his authority. Like, does this man have any authority? Can we really trust this man? Who does he think he is? He's not one of us. And such people, such false teachers, such carnal Christians, have never gone away. But here Paul wants to beg the question as to whether or not he needs to reintroduce himself to the Corinthians. Because some of them were of the belief that perhaps Paul wasn't reliable, that perhaps Paul wasn't legit, and that perhaps Paul was a false teacher. And that must have really grieved him. Look at verse 2, please. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. He's saying this, that you are our epistle, written in our hearts, we love you, and you love us, known and read of all men, people could see outside of Corinth that this community were a saved community, that their lives are being transformed, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, a transformed life, internally being seen externally, written not with ink, I throw back to the Old Testament, but with the spirit of the living God, in reference to the New Testament, not in tables of stone like the Ten Commandments, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So the background was quite simply this. You've got people going around, false Judaizers found over in Acts chapter 15, making the case, making the argument that it was necessary for the Gentiles to keep the Sabbath, to be law keepers, to circumcise their sons, to be careful what they would eat in order to be saved. And that caused a lot of grief to Paul and co. They were sent by the church in Antioch to go up to the mother church in Jerusalem to meet the apostles, to thrash this out, to have a conference. And here, this chapter, we'll look at the Old Testament versus the New Testament. Because like I say, you've got these Judaizers going around, questioning, attacking Paul's competency and authenticity. Can we really trust this man, Saul of Tarsus? Is he really an apostle? Or... We are the true apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the real deal, which, of course, feeds into Gnosticism. Look at verse 4, please. And such trust have we through Christ to God would. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The letter, the Old Testament kills. You try and keep the law. You try and go an entire day without gossiping, without being unkind, without uh, being the sort of person that you should be. The letter kills Old Testament, but the Spirit giveth life in reference to the New Testament. And such trust, verse 4 again, have we through Christ to God would. We're not trusting in ourselves. We are trusting in Christ, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. We're nothing in of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Contrast that to the false ministers of the New Testament, 
not of the letter, we weren't saved, we weren't chosen to do this as a result of some dubious letter, some forged letter, but of the Spirit, Christ would choose Paul and co. For the letter killeth, in reference to the Old Testament, but the Spirit giveth life. So once more, you've got two things. You've got the Old Testament, which points to the New Testament. The Old Testament was given as our schoolmaster to bring us to the Lord. Nobody could keep the Old Testament. Nobody could live the Old Testament to perfection. Only Jesus Christ could. But the Spirit, latter part of verse 6, giveth life. Going back to John chapter 6, these words that I speak unto you cannot save you. It is the law that will condemn, but the Spirit giveth life. And of course the Catholics get a hold of John chapter 6 and damn themselves. The Calvinists get a hold of John chapter 6 and damn themselves. Look at verse 7 please. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how should not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So once again, you've got a very clear analogy. And this, like I say, is being given to dismantle these false Judaizers that were going around trying to undermine Paul, trying to cheapen the grace of God. But if the ministration of death, but if the ministry of death written and engraven in stones, Ten Commandments, was glorious, it was glorious because God gave it, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be taken away, or which was to be done away. They couldn't see him when he came down from the Mount of Sinai because he spent time in the presence of deity. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Again, the contrast is Old Testament and New Testament. Verse 9, For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Ministration of condemnation, Old Testament. Ministration of righteousness, New Testament, exceeding glory. The overall point to get from this chapter, if you haven't got it already, is that Moses was all very well and good, but he wasn't perfect. The Old Testament was all very well and good, but it's now done away in the New Testament. 10. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. The psalmists on many occasions would say how much they loved the word of the Lord, how much they loved the law of the Lord. But if the truth be known, they couldn't keep it. Acts chapter 15, Peter made the case very eloquently that it was a burden to try and keep the law. They were unable to do so, and yet they were told to do so because they were Jews. And here Paul wants to continue to drive this point home, that the Old Testament will kill, but the New Testament gives life, and it also gives peace. 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ, blinded. They can't comprehend the new covenant. They can't comprehend Christ. Romans 10, 1 to 4 makes it very clear that they're going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness which is of Christ. Christ is the end of the law. The law will kill you. The law will destroy you. And yet, time after time, I meet so many people in the streets that teach a faith and works package. In fact, just yesterday, as we were going to Peterborough, there was a lady, a young lady, outside the bus station giving out tracts. You can call it a tract. And I read it twice, and I couldn't find the plan of salvation on there. And I asked some of the sisters to take a look, and they couldn't either. And I asked them to look if it was in small print. It wasn't there. And one of the sisters went back and spoke to this young woman and asked her to explain what the gospel was. And she couldn't really explain it. And she thought that the gospel, in essence, was Jesus coming to help us out, to carry our load, to make our life a little better. And the sister spent 30 seconds explaining the gospel to her. And she said, yes, I believe that to be the case. But the question gets asked, why not put it on the tract? Why not put one verse on the tract? If somebody was walking through Cambridge, was at their wit's end, 
and came across this young woman and looked at this pamphlet, they couldn't get saved. It was simply a promotional flyer to come to the church tomorrow to meet the pastor and get a great experience. We arrived in Peterborough two hours later and some gentleman came, uh, came over to us. One was holding this big speaker, giving out, uh, can I call them tracks? Pamphlets, again, I would imagine, and no gospel, simply a promotion of a church service. Five minutes later, two guys walked over, gave out their business card, and it was aimed at those with additional problems. Phone this number. We are a registered charity. We can help you out. No plan of salvation. And I thought within two, three hours, we've met three groups of people, one in Cambridge, two in Peterborough, no plan of salvation. What's going on here? Well, such people are keeping the goodies back for themselves. Such people want you to join their churches. This is the problem. And for those people, I will suggest this. So their minds are also blinded. Because in their minds, they are thinking that you can't be saved just by the blood. There has to be some works involved. And on top of that, we have to help you out. We have to disciple you, feeding into Gnosticism, feeding into the truth that there is extra truth or there. Uh, perceived truth that there is additional truth outside of the scripture which of course is heresy but here Paul is dealing with the Corinthians Gentile people in Greece and he's trying to reaffirm his credentials not that he needs to do so because they were already saved they were saved due to his preaching he would preach to them he would work alongside them he got them saved and I mean really saved and yet that doubt lingered in their minds. Is this man the real deal? Have we been deceived by him? Is it possible that there is truth outside of scripture? Is it possible that we have to do something to help the Lord Jesus Christ out? In fact, just yesterday, I counted four Jehovah's Witnesses, two women, two men walking in pairs, very well-dressed people wearing office gear. They made no eye contact with us. They walked straight past us. And I tried to witness to two of uh, the, both of these groups over a period of 15 minutes apiece. No um, effort on their part to engage us. Very self-righteous. And I know what these people believe. I've met many of these people over the years. They believe that they're good. They believe that they are now sinless. They believe that they're going to help Jesus out when it comes to beating Armageddon. They're not born again, of course. They don't confess to be born again. But they're going about to establish their own righteousness. Romans 10, 1. Romans 10, verse 1 to 4 again, and as such have not submitted themselves to the righteousness which is of Christ. Christ is the end of the law, and as a result, they're going to be damned, which is what Paul is saying to these false teachers, perhaps carnal to some extent, that were going around trying to do religion, trying to get people back under the Mosaic Covenant, which will kill you, which will deceive you. In fact, just this morning, I was speaking to one of the sisters about some of the crowd on YouTube, and there are so many people on YouTube, and some of the most prominent ministries on YouTube are run by Seventh-day Adventists. And they're very slick. They're very careful when it comes to how they present themselves. They don't come out and say that they are SDA. They will give a message, and sometimes it's very good. Sometimes they will take the Catholic Church apart and then slip in the Sabbath, slip in dietary restrictions, slip in this, slip in that, and according to Galatians 5, they will cause you to fall from grace. In fact, just this week, I got an email from somebody in America, a professor of physics, very interesting email, and it looked a very friendly email, and this professor was offering to send me some of his books, and I said, thank you very much, this is my address, and we did a quick Google search, and it turned out this man was a part of the Church of God, a follower of Herbert Armstrong, a dead heretic who was a great proponent of Sabbath keeping, dietary restrictions, tithing, this and that, and again, is an enemy of the cross, completely would attack the gospel of the grace of God. Nothing much has changed. So verse 11 down to 14 speaks about Israel being blinded and also from this epistle chapter 4 Satan has blinded the minds of those that will not believe for until this day verse 14 remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away in Christ Christ died on the cross 
and the veil was ripped from top to bottom. There was an earthquake. Many of the saints were resurrected, walked around Jerusalem. And some people have suggested that perhaps Joshua was one of those people. Perhaps Aaron was one of those people. Perhaps Moses was one of those people. We don't know, of course. It's speculation. But the point, again, is that Israel is blinded. Israel is an unbelief. Israel, for the most part, wouldn't even believe their own prophets. They would clash with their own prophets. They would attempt to kill their own prophets. But the latter part of verse 14, which veil is done away in Christ. Christ is greater than Moses. Christ is greater than Solomon. Christ is greater than Jonah. Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. If you've got Jesus, you've got everything. You were told over in Colossians 2.10 that if you are in Christ, you are complete. And that is profound. And yet, if you meet people in the streets, nine times out of ten, they don't tell you that. They don't even believe that. In fact, the simplest way to check someone out is to see what they believe. Get a statement of faith from them. Do they preach the blood? Do they teach once saved, always saved? Do they use the King James Bible? And nearly everyone that I've ever met doesn't. Fifteen. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. They are blinded. They are in the bondage of a system. And I go back to my conversation with some Jewish gentlemen earlier this week. They were from Manchester and London. And we got some photographs of that conversation and some recordings to go online shortly. And I said to them, well, what do you guys do about the Sabbath? What do you guys do about the atonement? What do you guys do about Jews that break the Old Testament? You were told very clearly back in the Torah that if a Jew broke the Sabbath, it meant death. If a Jew was caught practicing homosexuality, it was death. If a Jew was caught practicing witchcraft, it was death. I'm not saying they should do that. I'm not saying they should implement that. But my point is this. Without the New Testament, they are still under the Old Testament. And he said to me, well, we haven't got that authority. Yes, you have, I said. The authority was given to Moses and the children of Israel. Why are you not enforcing it? And they couldn't really answer that. Because if they do, they will be arrested for murder in this country. The same is true of the Seventh-day Adventists. They're very hot on the Sabbath, and yet put the question to them. What do you do when someone doesn't keep the Sabbath? Do you kill them? Of course they don't. But they're told to. Do you keep the law to the letter? Of course they don't, but they're told to. I made the case some uh, weeks ago concerning some of these wealthy Gentiles that convert to Judaism. And I mean very wealthy. And yet they were, they were told that on the seventh day, on the Sabbath day, let me correct myself, on the Sabbath day, they were to rest. They weren't to work. They weren't to make any money. They had Sunday through to Thursday night to make their money, get their food in stock up if you will and then friday night to saturday night they were to rest not just to have fellowship with each other not just to worship the lord but to stop making money and yet i put it this way how many jews around the world how many messianic jews around the world how many unsaved jews around the world have websites have businesses and how many of these people shut their websites down from friday night to Saturday night. Makes you think, doesn't it? It sounds so pious. We keep the Sabbath. We get dressed up. We close our front doors. We remember what the Lord told us to do. We keep the Passover. We keep this. We keep that. And yet the money keeps on coming in. And they violate the Old Testament. My point is simply this. You can't keep the Old Covenant. You can't fulfill it to the letter. And if you break it, and they do, they don't then go and kill the guilty party. They are inconsistent. They are following a tradition. 15 again. But even until this day, when Moses is read, Old Testament, but the Torah specifically, the veil is upon their heart. Not literally, metaphorically speaking, of course. In fact, it's almost as if Paul is speaking in parables here. Like Jesus would do to the unbelieving Jews. Paul is a saved Jew. Writing to save Gentiles, there will, be sa there, there will be some saved Jews present, of course, but for the most part, they are saved Gentiles. And yet he's speaking to them in parables almost, almost in coded language, because the hearts aren't right. They have reverted to carnality. They are questioning somebody who loved them so very much. 16. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. 
When it Israel, when it believing Israel shall turn to the Lord, like tribulation, like the 144,000, the veil shall be taken away. Not a literal veil. Go back to John 6 again. The flesh profits nothing. It is a spirit that giveth life. Christ was not a literal loaf of bread. Christ was not a literal door. Why can't people get this straight? 17. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. A great verse for the deity of the spirit of the Lord. And the latter part of 17. There is liberty. Liberty in Jesus. And also the Wonderful truth that if you're saved, you shouldn't fear dying. If you're saved, according to Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation. And yet, put such a statement to those that were attacking Paul. Put such a statement to those that I meet in the streets, that we all meet on the streets. They have no liberty. They have no peace. They are churned up inside. They think they are saved. They hope to be saved. But they have this great fear that perhaps... They're not saved. Now the Lord Elohim is that spirit. The spirit is Elohim. The spirit is Jehovah. The spirit is Yahweh. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Yes, only if you are in Christ Jesus. If you're not in Christ Jesus, you are outside of Christ Jesus. And therefore the wrath of the Lord abideth upon you. 18. But we all... With open face beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirits of the Lord. But we all, Paul includes himself and his audience, and precariously those of us around this table this morning, with open face beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. So first century glasses, or first century mirrors, I should say, were somewhat obscured, not particularly clean. And you would look into the mirror in the first century and get a distorted image uh, played back to you. If you think of a fair ground, if you go to a fair ground, some of these mirrors are very twisty and they distort your appearance. So we see the Lord slightly in a distorted sense. We are still being uh, sanctified, but we will be changed, latter part of 18, into the same image from glory to glory. We are being transformed into the image of Jesus in a way that we don't quite understand, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, being the Holy Ghost, of course. So I will just spend a few moments wrapping up this chapter and say this, that Paul was their spiritual father. Paul was dealing with false teachers, perhaps carnal Christians. And yes, you can be carnal and be a false teacher temporarily, of course, it could be suggested that a perpetual false teacher was never saved to begin with. I don't know. That will be dealt with the judgment seats of the Lord. But these false teachers, these carnal Christians, were constantly questioning and attacking Paul's competency and authenticity, which must have driven him crazy because he loved the Corinthians more than anybody else. Always answer a question with a question. People say to us, for example, what church you're from? Or, why are you here? What's the purpose of your presence? And it's always worth saying to them, where are you from? Why are you here today? In fact, are you giving out any tracts? I can't see any tracts on you. What church do you go to? And if they tell you, you could ask them why they go to such a church. You could say, this church believes this, this church believes that. Answer a question with a question. We're not on the streets to be interrogated by religious people. We're on the streets to get people saved. We're not going to run away from questions if they are... Sincere questions. But like I said before, if you weren't on the street giving out tracts, if you weren't holding up a banner, they wouldn't come over to you. They wouldn't go up to you in a supermarket or at the bus stop or at the bank and say, are you born again? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? They want to just interrogate you. Also, these false teachers may have forged letters from Jerusalem undermining Paul and go back to Acts 15. You want to understand what that would entail. The Church of Rome is also guilty of forging 2nd and 3rd century documents. There are gaps in the New Testament, and there are gaps for a reason. You don't speculate. You don't say, well, when Jesus was 12 to 30, he did this, he did that. We don't know what he did from the age of 12 to 30. So leave it as it is. But these false teachers, probably Judaizers, were forging letters from Jerusalem, the mother church, saying, 
that the church has said this, the church has said that. And of course, they were arriving in Corinth saying, look what we've got, everybody. We've got a letter from James. We've got a letter from Peter. And he says this and he says that. And these people are saying, really? You mean to say that Paul isn't this great teacher? And as a result, would undermine the Apostle Paul, going back to those that try to undermine what we do on the streets around the UK and cause people to be damned. The Church of Rome and other groups have been guilty of also forging, like I say, second and third and even fourth and fifth century documents. And it caused many people to uh, have their faith shaken. The Corinthian Christians were transformed. They were born again. And their lives were evidence of this life-changing gospel. Not some letter, some false authority. In fact, if you think of Matthew 21, 27, the Pharisees would say to Jesus, where do you get your authority from? Where are you from? Who do you think you are? You're going around preaching this message. You think you have this great authority. And he would answer a question with a question. It's the quickest way to cut through the red tape. It's the quickest way to deal with people that want to tie you up. They're not your friends. They're your foes. If they really believed what we believed, they would be giving out tracts. They would take a stand on the streets of Peterborough, Cambridge, Huntington, Ely, Manchester, Barcelona, Charlotte, Singapore. These false teachers not only had no authority, but many also had been guilty of Gnosticism. Going back to the scripture is all very well, but there is truth outside of the scripture. And of course, we have it. Like the JWs, like the Mormons, come along, join up with us. We will further help you out. We will further initiate you. In fact, I made the case yesterday watching these four JWs walking around Peterborough, somewhat smug. And I thought this, that they're worse than the Masons. I mean, at least when you see the Masons or you read about the Masons, you know he's down with such people. This crowd won't even give you a second glance. And of course, Rome has also been guilty of Gnosticism. They say that the Bible is all very well, but don't forget the magisterium of the church. Don't forget the papacy. Don't forget the cardinals, the bishops. They have the real authority when it comes to interpreting the scripture, and yet they don't even believe it. The letter, being the Old Testament, being the law, kills. See Galatians 3, 13 to 14, but the spirit, new birth, gives life. See John 5, 24. Ministration, being ministry of death. See James 2, 10. The law is good, godly, and glorious because God gave it, but only Jesus was able to keep it, fulfill it, and live it to the letter. Never mind the big sins. You try and go 24 hours. You try and go 48 hours. You try and go 72 hours without gossiping, without being unkind, without being generous, without taking the time to help someone out. It's very difficult. Without Christ, the Old Testament is unintelligible. In fact, it's a closed and obscure book, only accessible to the new birth. And that's why it's always worth saying to atheists and critics of the scripture that this book isn't for you until you are born again, because you are dead. You are spiritually dead. It's a closed book to you. That doesn't mean that God doesn't want to save you. Of course he does. That doesn't mean he doesn't want you to know this book. Of course he does. But it's closed to you. That's why you must be born again. And this crowd, I believe, were born again. I believe they were born again, but I believe they were deceived, like most people today. Liberty in Jesus means no longer bound by the law and so-called holy living. Hebrews 2, 14 to 15. No longer fearful of dying, death and destruction. Again, see Romans 8, 1. You got freedom from past, present and future sins. That's good news. That is really good news. And that's why we are here today. To get the gospel out. That's why we've been here for the last several days. To get the gospel out. But Paul, as a great godly saved Jew, was almost having to reaffirm his credentials to a group of carnal Christians. And yes, you can be carnal and be saved. And yes, you can be legalistic and be saved. And yet your life will be a misery. You'll be a great failure. And as a result, go on to cause others to struggle and stumble and sink if they're not careful so 18 verses from second corinthians chapter 3 still a very difficult epistle to understand and like i've been saying it's one thing to read it to yourself but it's something very different to read it and teach it 
to others. I'm also very mindful that Paul is using the Old Testament. He's using the Old Testament to demonstrate the superiority to the New Testament. He wants you to know that Moses was a good man, but only had so much of the truth. Jesus was a greater man and, and had all of the truth. And Jesus would delegate the truth to the apostles. Go back to what I said before. The apostles during the first century were the custodians of the new covenant. That's why they met daily. That's why they spent so much time at the feet of the apostles. Because the apostles were receiving progressive revelation. Not these false Gnostics going around trying to get in on the glory. Once the apostles died, the New Testament was written and completed. Hence why we are Bible-believing Christians. Paul reaffirms his credentials. He makes it very clear that the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. He wants them to know that Moses was a good man, but wasn't perfect. Was somewhat obscured by receiving all of Jehovah's message. Going back to one man, not having all of the glory. But the veil is currently on the minds and hearts of the children of Israel. Still very much relevant for today. But one day, one day the veil will be taken away, which also goes uh, against replacement theology. Almighty God is not through with the Jews. They are still beloved and yet blinded, which means they're not saved. And we can tell Jews that. We can tell Jews that Jesus loves them, died for them. And if they don't believe on him, they are condemned. Just like the Gentiles. 15 speaks about the veil. Still very much obscuring Jesus. But 16 makes it very clear that when they, Israel, shall turn to the Lord, and they will, the veil shall be taken away. Which is great news for Israel. Hence why we are pre-millennial. Hence why we are very pro-Israel. Hence why we love the Jews. And yet, as I say, warn them about dying without Jesus. 17 the Spirit is the Lord, the Lord is a Spirit, and not in reference to being the same person, but in reference to enjoying the same attributes of deity. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, liberty from past, present, and future sins, liberty in Jesus, liberty to be at peace with Almighty God, liberty to rejoice in one's salvation, liberty to go into the streets and give out tracts, get the banner up, to Present this great God and Saviour that we all love and worship to unbelieving people. 18, one more time, and I will close. But we all, without exception, with open face, beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. We get a snapshot of him, and we get saved. We don't quite see him like he is currently. And that's another uh, point which needs to be made in reference to those that claim to go into heaven and back, and are able to give a great description of the Lord. They are lying. We can't quite see him. Go back to my analogy of a first century mirror. Not as good as today's mirror. It was distorted. It was scratched. It was damaged. You couldn't quite see clearly. And the same is true of us when it comes to seeing the Lord. We're by faith, not by sight. We are changed on a daily basis through sanctification into the same image from glory to glory, day by day, hour by hour, even as by the spirits of the Lord. And that's why you can say, I am saved, I am being saved, I am going to be saved. Concerning sanctification, not justification. Justification meaning exoneration, sanctification meaning growth, meaning development, meaning maturity. And I'll close it there, and next week, Lord willing, pick it up from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 